Wolfgang, hello, hello. Hi. I'm so happy to see you, Wolfgang. Well, I'm glad to see you back there. Are you, you're in Hungary, right? I assume. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I'm in Hungary. I'm in Budapest. And where are you um, at this moment? Well, I'm in a small village outside of a small village in the northeastern state of Vermont, in a little village called Williston, which is oh, 12 kilometers from Burlington, our bigger city in our state of Vermont. So yes. I'm at home. So uh, at home. We, yes. university is absolutely closed. So we're all working from home. And I have been very lucky that I have been uh, a few times at home and I have been able to use your books. Yeah, we have well, my wife, I, my wife, uh, yeah. So just my fantastic times. I have very fond memories of you being here and, and uh, it seems like an awful long time ago but still maybe you can come again sometime and I can I maybe come to Hungary again one of these days. I hope, that would I, be hope. Nice. I hope that we will meet, I hope that we will meet. And yeah. now before we uh, start this interview I would like to introduce my guest today. My guest today is Professor Wolfgang Mieder. I met Wolfgang, do you remember when I met you? Well, probably in the 70s, Anna? No, no, no. In the 70s, I was, uh, I was um, a schoolgirl in, um, in Moscow. So it was in 89, when in 89, 89 uh, there was a conference in Budapest. And it was my first That's... international conference or international congress I attended. And you were... You were the chairperson, and everyone was talking. Welcome, Mieder is coming. Welcome, Mieder is coming, and you—you you were chairperson. <laughs> Welcome, and no, I, I didn't know. I didn't know that. <laughs> was that was that when uh, uh, Wilmos Feucht introduced us, Anna? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. And I remember at that time, uh, just a, a couple of days before my paper. Uh, the son of uh, Dimitris Lokatos told me that I should present my paper and afterwards I should say something like, and for those of you who have been sleeping through my paper, I would like to summarize. And you know, and it was my first uh, paper delivered to the international conference and I thought it was very funny. And, uh, and this is what I did. And afterwards I felt so, so ashamed. <laughs> You said no, no one was asleep. So, <laughs> but for me, it sounded really like very, very humorous. So, Wolfgang, today I would like to ask you a lot of questions, a lot, a lot of questions about your life, about your career, uh, about uh, where you were born, uh, where you live right now, and many, many other issues. But before I do it, could you introduce yourself? Could you say something which you think is important for you know, those of uh, people who are going to watch us? <laughs> I always find that very difficult. But anyhow, you already mentioned my name. I'm, I'm Wolfgang Mieder. I am a professor of German and follow at the University of Vermont. And I'm happy to report that uh, this fall in August, I will start my 50th year of teaching at the University of Vermont. And uh, so uh, it has been a, a very good run all these years. Um, I'm very dedicated to the state of Vermont and, and our rural community and of course the university. So there were opportunities to move back to Europe, to go to Germany or, or maybe even move on uh, to another university here in the United States. But uh, my wife and I uh, really feel very much at home here. And at the university, uh, as a professor of German, I've taught basically pretty much everything from language to culture to, to uh, literature, of course. And uh, then as my uh, interest shifted and I became involved with the stuff of folklore, that is really when, that is really what gave me the opportunity to overcome the, uh, let's say, limitations or confines of being a German professor in a foreign country, you know, so I could relate to you, for example, Anna, and to my many international friends who 
share my interests in folklore, folk narrative, and of course, uh, especially uh, with proverbs. So many times people have asked me, why did you stay at the University of Vermont? You know, small, relatively small university with about 12,000 students, at least in America, that's relatively small. But um, it's of course also the kind of life that we have enjoyed here in, and you know it, here in, in, the, in, the, in a state that is relatively little populated and is beautiful as far as the countryside is concerned. And of course nowadays with the media and online uh, availabilities, you can almost work anywhere really. So, so it has been a very good life here in Vermont. Yes, absolutely. And I can also prove it. Uh, it was years ago when I visited you. Once I visited you in summer and uh, uh, once I visited you in winter. And in winter it was, I believe, in 99. So in 98, 99, I was awarded a Fulbright scholarship. That's and, right. uh, uh, my mentor at that time was uh, Ellen Dundas, a very good friend of yours, and I was at California, or at the University of California, or uh, at Berkeley, and uh, you invited me to have a paper you know, there to deliver a lecture at the university, and my first book, Welcome, was published while I was uh, spending my Fulbright scholarship, and it was the book, which I would like to show to, uh, to you, <laughs> to <laughs> remind yeah, you. Was a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it was quite a lot of time, a long time ago, Twisted Wisdom, Modern Anti-Proverbs. Yeah, that's what, got, that's what got your interest in Anti-Proverbs started, didn't it? Yeah. Uh, okay. well, it I was, was glad. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I was glad that you were able to go to Berkeley and, and, and you know, of course, that uh, Alan Dundas was my best friend, you know, yes. and he, he, he was, of course, 10 years older than I am. So uh, he died in 2005 and uh, you may recall that uh, at the time of his death then I uh, published our correspondence, you know, yes, yes, yes. 35 years of friendship and and I still miss him. I have a picture on my bookshelf of him. Mm -hmm. yes, one, yes. one here at home and one at my office. So I mm -hmm. look at him every day. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I have this book at my home. So you send it. Yeah, this book. sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, Wolfgang, I would like to ask you the questions about your dreams. So when you were oh. there, are <laughs> so now at first let us go to your dreams. When you were a child, uh, what dreams did you have about your future? Oh, oh that's, that I can actually answer relatively easily. Uh, well, uh, growing up in Germany in the 50s was, I think, for many young children, not without its problems. You know, the war was over, there was um, uh, concerns about what the German people did during the World War II. The teachers were in many ways frustrated, uh, maybe because of their past, but also if they were young teachers because they have lost, they lost years. So it wasn't a particularly happy time at school. And I remember vividly that in the late 50s, many of my fellow uh, high school students I had that dream about spending a year in America, you know, and, and I was one of those uh, youngsters who, who uh, just by hook or by crook <laughs> uh, wanted to go to the United States for a year. And uh, I applied, uh, the, one of the ways to get to America for a year was with the so-called American Field Service. That was the major organization that made these type of, uh, studies possible and uh, but I was a little bit too young but fortunately I had met an American journalist uh, in Germany by chance and uh, I wrote him a letter and I included a little passport picture and basically 
asked him if he could put a note in the Detroit newspaper and ask if there might be some families who would take me. And lo and behold, 12 families said, send that kid. And, and so um, I was able uh, to fulfill my dream. And in a roundabout way, it was my fortune that I did not come with an exchange program because I would have had to return after one year. <laughs> and being at an impressionable age, I left when I was 16. Uh, I fell in love with this country. It, it, uh, you know, I wanted to have my own start. I wanted to stand on my own two feet. And I believed in America being the land of unlimited opportunities, you know, young as I was. So, and I felt so very good to be in an American high school. I, 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 I had wonderful teachers, all of a sudden, I wasn't as stupid as I've always been told. And so I started begging my parents to please let me stay, which of course was very difficult. But uh, eventually they gave in. And I still remember on my 17th birthday, uh, February 17, 1961, I received a telegram. You know, at that time, you didn't necessarily call i have your iphone <laughs> or zoom or skype i got a telegram and all that the telegram said do darfs bleiben you are allowed to stay and that was oh. of course, that was the fulfillment of my dream so 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 i stayed and i didn't go home for four years actually so between the ages of 16 and 20 uh, i was alone in America. It was hard for my parents and my sister. Not so hard for me, I have to be honest, because I was doing what I wanted to do, you know. But uh, anyhow, we, we had all kinds of wonderful arrangements. Uh, I uh, agreed with my parents that I would write a letter every Sunday, which I'm doing. You know, by, by, by mere chance, and I think I have it right here. Let me show you. Uh, this is really by chance. There's nothing to do with the interview. Look at this. Here's a letter. Can, can you see that? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Here's a handwritten letter of, of October 7, 1961. Uh, I wrote to my parents. And what I'm doing is every day I have, you know, for over 30 years, I have a letter a week. So what I'm doing is some of the let some of the early letters between 60 and 63, let's just say, are getting so brittle, and and I used kind of airmail paper, you know, that very thin paper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing is I'm kind of transcribing them into the computer, and that's so whenever I have a minute when I say, well, I've worked enough, why don't you take a break? I type, I retype one of the letters, and it kind of brings back some nice memories. Uh, you know, I think you know this, Anna. I, I moved from family to family. And then it didn't take long. Uh, first, I stayed with the journalist for a month. Then I lived with a wonderful young couple, Ted and Sharon Scott. They were, newly, they were newlyweds, but they took me in. <laughs> the three of us would go with the car to the drive-in movie theater at night. It was just like two oh. teenagers. But anyhow, I... I wound up in a, in a, in a funeral home. And uh, so when I read the letters, you know, I describe how we would go on ambulance calls and how we would pick up uh, people who died in an accident. And then also the dead people, of course, you know, in the funeral home. So I had all those experiences, but it was all, it has all been worthwhile. But, and and as you, since you asked about my dream, Anna, that was my dream. And, and so, I have always considered myself very fortunate that uh, as a modern immigrant uh, that I could fulfill that dream without my dear parents force, forcing me to come back because except for one of my uncles to whom I'm forever grateful, everybody, teachers, friends, all told my parents bring the boy home. Mm -hmm. So it was a tough decision, but, uh, uh, and you know, you have to give credit where credit is due. So I'm, I am very, very thankful for, not only for my parents and my sister for letting me do this, but also to 
Well, all the people who helped me, Anna, you know, we don't get and we don't succeed without help from others. You know, I don't care how hard you work, you still uh, rely on other people's goodwill. So uh, it, uh, but to maybe one more thing, Anna, I, I want to give some credit to my American teachers. Um, you know, for a long time, there was that European vision also in Germany particularly, of thinking that American high schools are no good. You know, they're not, they don't quite have the standard of the gymnasium in Germany. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the American high school, that is of course basically for everybody, as you know, without differentiation, how smart you are and so on. Uh, I, uh, I thrive there, Anna. Just the idea of a teacher being kind and in showing interest, in challenging you, and 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 uh, giving you a chance, uh, made a giant difference. I have absolutely fantastic memories of of those teachers. Know them by name, think about them, and uh, they helped to make me what I became. There's no, there's no doubt about it. Um. Well, again, what you have just said is, of course, we rely on some other people. So, uh, could you mention the names of people you are mostly grateful for? So, people who have influenced your uh, scholarly career most. Well, I mean, it. Um, you know, some of those people. Well, the the people who have been uh, the most influential also to my wife Barbara, uh, once we you know met and so on, wa was uh, my American family, uh, George and Catherine Shum, uh, from outside Detroit. They, they really kind of became my substitute parents and also my wife's uh, over many, many years after we were married. Um, they had two sons, or they had two sons. Uh, George is a philosophy professor at Ohio State. And Tom is a, is a businessman, but in that family, Anna, my, oh, whatever you want to call it, my intellectual development <laughs> blossomed. I, I mean, I was in an environment that, that uh, was not only intellectually inclined, but also very much involved in philanthropy, in uh, uh, caring about African Americans. For example, they had a, um, an African American girl our age, Gloria, who, who spent time with us and so on. So I learned a, a great deal uh, from them. Then of course, once I went to the university, uh, a, a number of professors, uh, like in your life too, I mean, you know, professors have an incredible influence on us, not always <laughs> necessarily positive, but you know, you can also learn from a professor not to do certain things. But anyhow, my, my experiences have been uh, very, very positive. And, and really, Anna, I think to mention some people whom you know or whom other people know, uh, there are two people, uh, two uh, professorial uh, colleagues that stand out and there are many others but there are two that stand out and that is of course Alan Dundas uh, here in America. One, once I met Alan Dundas and I know exactly when in 1973 at an American Folklore Society meeting in Nashville um, he and I uh, just bonded. I mean we you know he as I said he was 10 years older he was so famous that I couldn't you know, barely touch him. Uh, but we became such good friends and and learned from each other, or I more from him than he from me. But, uh, and of course, I traveled out to California every year to the Western States Folklore Society meeting. So I always spent one or two days with him. So in a way, Anna, I was a I could have developed into a run-of-the-mill German professor. That would have been perfectly fine. But once I met Alan Dundas, and of course you know this, I had written my dissertation on the <clears throat> use and function of proverbs in uh, uh, Jeremias Gotthelf, a Swiss novelist. 
So in a way, I was already doing proverb studies. But once I met Alan Dundas, he opened up international folkloristics for me. Mm -hmm. So that was one luck. My other fortune was a person whom you also know, and that's Lutz Röhrig in Germany. Yes, yes, yes. So, so, so Lutz was 20 years older than I. He died in 2006. And I also published our correspondence. So my incredible fortune, Anna, has been that I had Alan Dundas as a mentor and friend and colleague and here in the United States. And I had Lutz Röhrig as a mentor and friend and colleague in Germany. So Lutz Röhrig introduced me to the European Society of Folk Narrative Research. Alan Dundas did it here. Both of them, this is kind of a, uh, with all humility, I will say this, both of them wanted me to come either to Berkeley or to Freiburg. Mm. So I always knew I, I could move on. But, but, notice Anna, both of them left me by now 15 years ago. So if I had moved to Berkeley or if I had moved back to Germany, uh, uh, I would long have been alone by now. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm, uh, so I'm not sure that you would have been alone. Yeah, but uh, anyhow, I'm sure I, that you would have met a, a number of others. Yeah. But now, in, in addition, yeah. uh, now, Anna, those are my two heroes. You know, that, that yes, is a yes. known fact, and I've never hidden it. And I, I personally feel I owe my. Uh, my little successes in, 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 in many ways to them. But, but then, there were, then there are so many, many people whom you, all, you already mentioned, Demetrius Lucatos, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who, who lived to be almost 100. You already mentioned, uh, or I mentioned, Wilmos Voigt, still in contact with Wilmos. We write once in a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's Carl Lindahl, who, of course, you know. There are, oh, gosh, there are... Uh, you know, there's Casis Grigas, there's Jula Pajolet, there are uh, Rui Suarez, uh, you, know, you, know, you know all my friends. Hello. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 um, as I say, the, the, there will be so many names. But one thing, Anna, that I always tell my students is that, uh, you know, we all, the, the interrelationship, I think, among professorial types, you know, the learning from each other and the supporting each other uh, is, I think, so very important. And, and not to forget that you are only a little chain, little link in a giant mm -hmm. international chain. And, you know, during your life, you can play, that's my clock, you can play a little role uh, and not to forget that uh, there were many important people that came before you. Now, in our, in our proverb research, Anna, I mean, there were people like Archer Taylor, Bartlett Jerry Whiting, you know, uh, Matty Cousy, of course. What would we be without them? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so I resent, I resent the term cutting edge research because it, it neglects that whatever new things you and I discover, Anna, almost always isn't really possible without standing on the shoulders of some of those heroes. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think we should not forget that. Now, let me say one other thing about cutting research while it's on my mind. Cutting research is, of course, very, very important. In other words, being at the very, very, what, at the most modern part of whatever scholarship you happen to be doing. But what I think many people forget is that research projects also have, to a certain degree, just basic hard work. Mm -hmm. You, know, you can't be an Albert Einstein all the time. You, know, you can have that one breakthrough, real breakthrough in your career or in your life, or two maybe, or three. 
but there is nothing wrong in saying I will dedicate my life to collecting anti-proverbs. So much, much of that is basic labor, but it has yes. to be done. It has to be done. And that's why I think publishers are so wrong when they don't want to publish collections, especially in folklore, Anna. Folklore needs collections, need texts. Otherwise, all the theory is no good if we don't also have the materials to back them up. So anyhow, I just thought I'd throw that in because um, uh, in, in academia, people who judge you or a young assistant professor, they are too quick to belittle certain types of scholarship, like book reviews. Someone has to write book reviews. We all like them. But so we shouldn't belittle it when someone writes a book review, you know, or publishes a, a, a collection. Um, so, uh, uh, or publishes an article in a journal that is a regional journal and not in the best Hungarian journal like you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so in other words, some projects, no major university press or no major international renowned journal will publish because they're too specific. But that doesn't make them bad. Of course. Yes. Yeah. So, so those are some things that, that I worry about at times. At my age, Anna, it is irrelevant to me. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> and, if I, uh, and if I were a young assistant professor, I would have to play the game, wouldn't I? Absolutely. Uh, Wolfgang, and as far as I can remember, you are uh, 76 years old right, uh, right now. Yes, yes. I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <Getting there. laughs> okay. And uh, just to those uh, of you who are going to watch us, I would like to show to you three fast trips. Uh, I contributed to three of them. Uh, uh, and if you do not know what a fast shift is, a fast shift is uh, a collection of articles, scholarly articles, which are put together in order to celebrate a scholar's birthday. And most frequently people start gathering uh, these articles when someone is 70 years old or maybe even older. But welcome with you. That was the first fast shift I contributed. Oh, that, was the, that was a big surprise. So, oh yeah. And, and you were even present uh, oh, there. That was, that, that was in West Frame, right? Yes, yes, yes. It was in uh, West Frame and you were only 60 years old. And this was yeah, the- Chab Chabba uh, Földes Chabba edited. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Chabba Földes and I also contributed uh, this. Of course you did, sure. Uh, yes, and, and there was this fast shift I also contributed. Uh, so I was very happy. Um, you know, if I may say, I, oh, I, I like the title of this particular fast shift, the proverbial Pied Piper. That, that was a wonderful idea because I teach the Pied Piper legend, you know, so mm -hmm. I was very yes, touched. Yes, yes. And actually to this fast shift, I even contributed with two articles. One article was in English and another one uh, was in, uh, in Russian language. That's right. I like I like that that it was in, in Russian. In uh, Russian, yes, yes. So that that too. I, I the title, Bestat ki sito dat, uh, is kind of a Latin proverb that that I I don't know. I kind of made my uh, modus operandi in my life. Uh, as you know, Anna, I was chair of the German Russian department for. More than, more than 25 years or for 30 years uh, yeah or th 31 i guess or 31 yeah. Yes, yes yeah i uh, and then i i gave it up with a heavy heart because i really enjoyed being being chair of the department but you know younger people need a chance and anyhow uh, uh i've always felt that in a leadership position let's just say as a chair or as a professor or as a human being if you have a chance to help someone, I think you should do it quickly, rather than saying, let's just say someone comes to your office and says, 
Anna, can you help me with this? And then you, you kind of already know you can probably do it, but you say, well, let me think about it. I might have to do a little bit of checking. Anyhow, I always feel that he or she who gives fast gives twice. I, mm -hmm. I think that is, a, that is not a bad, not a bad philosophy most of the time, anyhow. Uh, to, um, and I was so tickled that um, Kevin McKenna and, and Christian uh, Grandel, uh, the editors of it, uh, chose that as a, as a title. I was, I was deeply touched by that. Mm -hmm. uh, Wolfgang, and I know that uh, almost always you responded uh, to me within 24 hours uh, time. So if you do not travel, so you always respond at time. So it means that you do things really fast. Uh, Wolfgang, and uh, you have just mentioned one proverb. Do you have favorite proverbs? Yeah, I, I, well, that is, that's easy for me to answer, Anna. And you know, from a, from a, from a paramiological point of view, I think you will be interested in this. It would be more difficult for me to tell you which my three favorite proverbs are in German. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in English, I have no problems at all. Okay. Uh, and, yeah. and I, and I, I, uh, I um, and I'll tell you in a minute, because one of them is uh, highly international, but it doesn't sound all that good in German. Anyhow, the, um, I teach a class every year on the uh, nature and politics of Proverbs. And sometimes I have 80 students in it, sometimes I have 25 or 30. But anyhow, uh, when I finish the course, I always leave the students with my three favorite Proverbs. Mm -hmm. And of course, we've indirectly talked about them. Well, the first one is different strokes for different folks. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is an African-American proverb the earliest we have found it is in 1945, at, as far as a recorded, a written down reference is concerned. I like that proverb because I think it is a, a, a quintessential American proverb. It, it basically says, give me space to be myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, now, I always tell the students different strokes for different folks has an ethical element to it. It doesn't mean you can do whatever you damn well please. Mm -hmm. You still have to consider your fellow human beings, <laughs> you know. But anyhow, I think different strokes for different folks deals with individuality, liberty, and freedom, especially for the, yeah, for the individual, let's say. The other proverb that I really, really like was a favorite proverb of Dr. Martin Luther King. And I wrote a book about that, as you probably know. And I know, is, I have it at home. Yeah, it is, it is uh, God can make a way out of no way. I'm not at all a religious person, so I am pleased that there is a secular variant. So you see how important variants are in proverbs. Yes. The proverb, God will make a way out of no way, would not have become my popular, most popular proverb. But making a way out of no way, that I think is basically a, a positive, uh, uh, positive, you're the psychologist, what's the word I want? A positive uh, Optimistic. encouragement, an encouragement to get mm -hmm. involved to do something about racism in America, to do something about police brutality, uh, and so on. So making a way out of Norway, also in our relationships, Anna, with our students, you know, helping a student, you know, making something possible for a student, giving her a book that she can't afford. Okay, and the third one, is a proverb, and again, I want to stress this, has, for me, it is not religion, for me, it is just a, Oh, you could call it uh, with uh, Immanuel Kant, the categorical imperative, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It exists in every major religion in the world. And that I think translates basically into 
trying to be a halfway decent human being. That's all that we can do or should do. So those three, and I always get very emotional when I, when I do this with the students. I have to watch that I don't start crying. Mm. <laughs> and I always think that's, I, I tell them, you know, if, if those three guideposts uh, help you in your journey through your life, I think you'll do okay. By the way, President Barack Obama, for whom I have great admiration, and you know that, also. Yes, yes. Uh, you, also have a, you also have a book about uh, her, yeah. uh, his and, usage and, of comments. Yeah, you know, he has, he has that, he, before he became president, he wrote a book called Audacity of Hope. And there he says that the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, that is his, and I was so pleased, no wonder I like him because I had already reached that conclusion. But anyhow, the title, Audacity of Hope, of that book is just wonderful. You know, we, we have to be hopeful, Anna. Even during COVID-19, we got to hope that we can get a... Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, getting something that we can have a medicine against it. You know? so, uh, yeah, Audacity of Hope. That's... That's what young people need, of course, and old people too, old people too. You know, we can't just say we have racism. We, we have to say we can make a way out of no way. We, we can, it's very upsetting in America right now, Anna. Uh, you know, I was already in America when Martin Luther King was famous in the 60s, you know, and to basically see this wonderful country returning, uh, to such ills, or even to say that it is still so very much present, is, it, it can be very discouraging. Yes, yes, yes. But you have to try to make things better, you know. And uh, uh, so sometimes proverbs can help us a little bit. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wolfgang, you have just uh, mentioned this pandemic. Um, so how do you feel these days? Because what I have sensed from your letters, I have sensed from your letters that you are a kind of um, negative friend nowadays. So, so because uh, uh, how to say it? not negative, but 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 you have been uh, a little bit depressed. So so, so this is what yeah, de depressed or, or sad or or maybe sad because. Sad. Yeah, Says, says, yeah, depression isn't really part of my psychological makeup, uh, but sadness, I think. Sadness, uh, sadness, okay. And, and, and sadness, Anna, uh, uh, basically sadness because I cannot see my friends. I cannot go to the international uh, uh, folk narrative research mm -hmm. scal uh, 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 congress where I might have met you. or. Yes. Or I cannot uh, go to the American Folklore Society annual meeting. Uh, so so it, it's more like a sadness. Uh, I have enough, you know, being in contact with you, being in contact with His Histralina and all my other uh, good friends, Milita and so on, and Peter. Uh, I, I have enough through the internet and email and, and our publications and so on, uh, things to cheer me up. So, so de depression wouldn't be the right word. It's, it's more like, and Barbara, my wife says that too, we're, we're basically happy types, but the isolation and the not even being able to go to a restaurant. Oh, okay, I see. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit, um, not frustrating, but, uh, Disappointing, mm. yeah, sad is, is I think maybe a good word, but depressed. No, I, I, I am. I've always been a very positive thinker, uh, and uh, uh, but I know I, if I recall my little short messages, Anna, uh, um, I think I was just trying to be honest in saying, look, uh, things are not exactly yes, 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 yes. And, and, and I mean, and, and I got used to, or it's a very different uh, way you, you used to write your uh, messages. No. For what, that. Make, what, make, what makes me really sad, Anna, is I'm, I'm, I hadn't decided that I would retire um, 
once I finish my 50th year, mm. but having to spend my 50th year not even seeing my students, that does make me sad. Yes. <laughs> you know, and, and it makes me sad also because I know no matter how hard I try to teach online, it will not be the same. You know, but I'll, we'll, we'll deal with it. We'll yes, deal with yes, it. yes. I also, uh, you know, this term I also, uh, from the year, uh, from the middle of uh, March until uh, until May, I uh, had classes uh, just online. online and you know, there, there's no reason to complain. I mean, it, well, I, I, I'm just one of thousands of teachers. Think of the teachers, Anna. I mean, we, we professors, you know, we at least don't have as many classes as teachers have. Yes. Um, the entire teaching profession, just to pick on one part of our society, is dealing with this. So there's no reason to feel that we are, you know, are special. But, uh, and, and somehow uh, we'll deal with it. And if we get a vaccine, I finally remember the name, if we, if we get a vaccine, maybe by spring, what do you think? Maybe. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't watch any news to tell her the truth. So that in order to, to stay positive and optimistic, I try yeah. not to... Uh, well, you, 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 you are right, Anna. You, you are right. I mean, the, the media, the media is almost perhaps overkilling. Yes. We, we yes. need to be informed, Anna. We need to be informed. But to, 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 to get on on the television and to say once again the state x or the country x has the highest uh, corona uh, uh, new cases it's almost like a competition mm -hmm. yes, yes. So, I, mean, I mean that is a little bit absurd um, so i yeah and i think you're right we we need to be we need to be careful that societies are not going to say the hell with it we can't do anything about it anyhow so why should i care People okay <laughs> so, so it's not it's not what, what i'm doing oh uh, no 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 uh, no, no, but, I'm but, not, I'm not talking. no no i'm not saying no no i mean people in general yes uh, and, yes and, uh, and um, i mean more the people who especially in the united states um have no concern about the people around them Mm -hmm. That, I think, is a real, a real issue in our country and maybe worse than anywhere else in the world. It's, yes. uh, it, is a, it is a little bit, uh, you know, America is a federation, so every state has its own rights. So it is very difficult for the central government but in that, uh, to tell people what to do, Anna. That goes mm -hmm. from, you know, even schools. Every school district can decide what they want to do. So mm -hmm. there's no, no uniform approach to this in America. That's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, little bit easy, a little bit easier in a smaller country. Yes, yes, I agree. Or, and I think right now Hungary is much luckier than America is. Or uh, in Hungary, the situation uh, so far, is much, much uh, better than in Russia. Has uh, this pandemic brought out the good or the bad in people surrounding you? Oh, surrounding me. Oh, oh, oh. I, I would say surrounding me, absolutely the good. He's doing the social distancing. Um, and uh, uh, I, I couldn't report one bad experience I have had since March really. Mm -hmm. But we're lucky, Anna. I don't think Vermont is normal. Yes, okay, okay. And you know, but, but anyhow, uh, uh, I think, you know, people really are taking it seriously. And, and uh, uh, but in general, Anna, I would say, when you look at the medical profession, the nurses, the teachers, the bus drivers, the subway drivers, the pilots, all people who are in a service profession, I think have been absolutely amazing and very, very positive. But there are some bad people, of course. You know, and, I, I, and I would say, 
It is the people who think they are invincible. Unfortunately, also many young people. But, you know, you and I were young ones too. Yes, yes, yes. It is, it, is, it is part of being young to be a little bit um, flippant or maybe not quite as concerned. Um, but when you see uh, certain scenes, let's say at the beaches in California or at the beaches in Florida uh, or mass rallies, Mm -hmm. And people don't even try to wear masks. I think that's irresponsible. Mm -hmm. But in general, uh, I think uh, today, this morning, I heard on the news that the King of Spain uh, talked at a memorial for the almost 29,000 Spanish people who have died of mm -hmm. Corona. And, uh, and he was giving much praise to all those groups of people that I've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. it really made a difference, especially the medical profession, Anna. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Anyhow, I, I would say in general, I think people, yeah, you know, when there's a crisis of any type, uh, people usually pull together. You know, so I, I would say I would I would go I would go more good than bad. No doubt in my yeah. mind. This is not a good time for America, uh, uh, Anna. It, mm -hmm. uh, it, and it's all right for us citizens to to express a viewpoint that, um, you know, when I came to America, Anna. I, of course, was a child, you know, 16. Yes, yes. Uh, impressionable. But I just thought, I'll use, I'll use a proverbial expression, I thought America was the cat's meow. You know, it was just, <laughs> streets were paved with gold in California. Mm -hmm. uh, but to, to have experienced as an immigrant even, you know, a nationalized citizen, from 1960 to, to uh, 2020, that's 60 years, to see the image of America. And again, I want to stress, for heaven's sake, America was never perfect. <laughs> no, 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 no intelligent thinking person would claim that. But the image of America, the loss of its stature, uh, it is hard to believe, Anna. It is hard to believe. And you, and you know, you start to understand how Greece, ancient Greece, or ancient Rome, how eventually civilizations... America might well have reached its pinnacle. Mm. <laughs> but that is, of course, life too, Anna. Mm -hmm. I, it will be very difficult <clears throat> for America to regain nationally and internationally <clears throat> the uh, what? At least the image that we had of being a pretty damn good democracy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, see, now I use the word again. It's sad. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> not not depressing necessarily. Okay, because, okay. Remember, making a way out of no way. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, no, it 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 is. Uh, yeah, we'll have a hard time spinning out of this, and of course, COVID nineteen is partially to blame for all of it, Anna. You know. But not for not all of it. Not all of it. Yes. yes, yes. And you know and there are, there are many there are many documents in America. President Lincoln uh, once, you know, kind of referring to the con beginning of the Constitution, basically to make this a more, a more perfect union. Nobody ever said it was perfect, but to make it better. Mm -hmm. What what proverb are you thinking of? Hope springs eternal. I like this probe. <laughs> I, I do too. I do too. Yes, yes. So, yeah. 
uh, Wolfgang, and what um, do you think, what will the world be like and what will America be like uh, after uh, this coronavirus pandemic? Hopefully one day it will be over. Yeah, 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 hopefully it will be over. I hope that America as a nation or as a country or as a, well, if you want to use the word, as a world power, will learn that it cannot always be on top. It cannot always feel like everybody has to dance after our tune. In mm -hmm. other words, I'd like us to get back to what President Obama and others before him have tried to be, and that is to be a fair player, you know, but without always having to be first. In other words, sharing a little bit more, uh, uh, not throwing our weight around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I think, Anna, we will have to learn that. We're learning it now. China is a very, very strong country. Russia is. Uh, other countries have great ideas. Um, and if we talk about globalization, it's 12 o'clock. <laughs> oh, yes, oh, 12 o'clock. Oh. You know, that, ma that, makes, that makes me think of a wonderful German <laughs> proverbial expression. It is five minutes to 12. Do you know that? That uh, means no, no, no. 12. in German, it, 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 it is 5 for 12. It is five minutes before 12, meaning you are reaching a stage of, of true crisis, like a okay. nuclear war or something. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, so I think, I think uh, if we talk about globalization, then I think the so-called superpowers have to be a little bit more willing to share in all of it, rather than thinking, I'm going to control the economy and I'm going to do this and so on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, so you, the crisis that, let's just say that the crisis that America is going through right now can, if you want to look at it positively, and I do, can look at it somewhat as a wake-up call for America. A wake-up call to be a little bit less uh, imposing. Mm -hmm. you know, so uh, uh, that could be maybe a good outcome of all of this. Uh, we cannot be the main player in everything, Anna. Nor should we be. This goes for Europe, of course, too, Anna. Yeah. Germany doesn't have to play the first fiddle all the time. And, and I think Europe is doing, or has been doing a good job. You know, here's something I think I can say nicely about Europe. The, since we're talking about COVID, I think COVID-19 has shown that Europe, even in a crisis, can hold on to its idea of a united Europe. Mm -hmm. You might have thought that nationalism and protectionism would take over, but it hasn't really, has it? People are still, I mean, you have had some borders closed, right? But that was uh, yes, just, it's just a lot of borders. That, that, was, that was just to protect, you know, and, and I, I kind of think we should do a little bit more like that in the United States. As I told you, every state does whatever mm -hmm. they want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. Europe, Europe is showing that, that uh, I used to think that if there, remember, when you were young, Anna, but in the early 1970s, when there was the international oil crisis, mm -hmm. uh, I feared for Europe at the time because mm -hmm. you know, people wanted gas, people wanted oil. But mm -hmm. I, think, I think right now, um, Europe has, is doing a good job in, 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 uh, in, in keeping together. And what does America do? We leave the World Health Organization. Can you explain that to me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wolfgang, and what will you do after the uh, pandemic is over? What will be the oh, first? <laughs> what, will, what will I do? I will, I will dance and have. Wow. <laughs> no, I will. I will. Well, what will I do? Well, you know, you mentioned my age. Uh, I hope that I can continue uh, a few more years with 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 my work. Uh, 
uh, being with with uh, colleagues and friends and neighbors and, and students and and uh, visiting my international friends and going to conferences. So I hope I can uh, carry on a few more years. I'm a realist, Anna. I I, I realize that my active my active teaching years uh, will come to an end. Uh, you know, maybe I can teach a couple, three more years. That would be nice if my colleagues still tolerate me. I'm sure they will. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, but you know, it's interesting, Anna. The, the end has to come sometime. You know, and and uh, I mean, I'm already seventy six. That is, I think by now I am probably the oldest professor on campus. Oh. Mm -hmm. You know, so so uh, I'm you know way beyond retirement age, and and I'm and I count my blessings. I mean, I'm healthy and and I I, I have my en my old energy, and and uh, uh, as far as work is concerned, Anna, I still have a lot of, <laughs> including with you and. Peter, yes, yes, yes. Peter, yes Peter, 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 Peter. Peter. Yeah, there's always one project after another. And, and uh, uh, if I can be a little bit of a player in the international paramiological club, so to speak, I might like to do that a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. I just would like to show to, uh, to our audience uh, some other books. So I have already shown my first book, which was published together with you. And our, it was published in uh, Vermont. And our, the second publication of this book uh, was in Tasmania. Oh, that's right, that's right. Uh, Theodor yes. Flanta did that, right. Uh, yes, uh, and we have published a book in Hungarian uh, language. Uh, it was published- I'm very proud of that, especially since I had very little to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, it was published in 2005 yeah, I under, under, uh, this book was published there uh, in 2006 uh, it was our second uh, yeah, that one, form of collection yeah, that, that book I use quite a bit I, I quote mm -hmm. out of it just like yes, you do that was that was the book that was published jointly at West Brain and, and in Burlington and in Burlington Yes, yeah. and last year, together with Wolfgang, we published oh, yeah. this book. Uh, so it was published by uh, Cambridge Scholars. And there are... Uh, you know, Anna, may maybe people think you and I are married. That would be so bad. <laughs> 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 they would do, you never know, you know. Oh, so, that's so, so actually, uh, I will ask you a number of questions about your wife. Yeah, you know, my wife, Barbara, you know, Barbara, she said to me, what the hell do you know about marriage, Wolfgang? I said, well, I said, Anna is the expert, I'm just the worker. <laughs> yes, okay, but, 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 I'm, but I'm not married now. And you, you are the guy who is married and you are the guy who has been married for, for how many decades have you been married? We, we, Bob and I have been married for 50, 51 years. For 51 years, wow. Okay, so I should, very shortly, I should, I should prepare another interview. It will be a very different interview. Your pieces of advice how to, uh, to be happily <laughs> right. married. Well, uh, I don't know. It's maybe just maybe it's just a matter of tolerating each other. <laughs> well, yeah. So tolerating been, each other. It's been a good run. We 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 we, we are very nicely matched. I have to mm -hmm. admit. Welcome. Uh, last year you sent to me uh, your CV. Now I haven't asked you to send it because I know that every day or every week you publish another book or every second week you publish another book, another article. So uh, do you know how many books have you published so far? Well, uh, I, I think and I, it of course depends, you know, there are edited books, there are, uh, you know, books that are truly completely written uh, uh, as a book, uh, so uh, well the number has added up in the last fifty years. I will, I will admit. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. <laughs> so, so, but uh, I know. it, it uh, uh, you know, I people ask me what drives you, Wolfgang. But uh, Wolfgang, sorry, sorry, sorry. I have to interrupt you. You haven't answered my question. So, how many books have we published so far? 
either yourself you know? or your courses? No, no, I oh, don't. Well, well, well uh, uh, that, many, many I, suppose, no, I suppose it, it goes into, it goes beyond a hundred. I know that. <laughs> it's more than 100. No, 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 it's yeah. more. It was, um, I think it was more than 200 many yeah, years. Probably, probably. So let's leave, let's leave it, let's leave it with that. Let's leave okay, it with, with that. that. And how many articles, how many articles have you? Oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe four or 500, I suppose. I think it's, it's more, or a few years ago, it was more. Well, yes, and yeah. I would like to show, I would like to show um, this volume. Yeah. Uh, this is the last one, or at least yeah, the, last the, one new one, the new one, the new one is finished. The, the new was in, in finished. Okay, it's yeah. Prepare Pen, Yearbook of International Proverbs Scholarship, and Wolfgang published the first one, oh, it was 37 years ago. Uh, 19, 1984. Yeah, it started in 1984. Yeah. So this is just unbelievable. And there at home, I have 36 volumes of this. Uh, mm -hmm. um, this, has, this has been this has been a, a, a labor of love. But you know, Anna, uh, it 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 has given me a chance to serve, uh, you know, friends like you and 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 also newcomers. You know, people who are who write for the first time about proverbs and so on. So uh, uh, that has been, uh, a, I mean, I can, I can honestly say Proverbium has been uh, my child, so to speak. Uh, I give much of my time to it. And if I may say so, much of my financial support to it, as you know. Yes, I know. I don't, mind. That, I'm not, I don't want any praise for it. It, 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 it. You know, we all decide where to make a commitment you know so proverbium to me has been one of those commitments where uh, as long as i can do it maybe a couple three more years uh, uh, i will do it you know mm -hmm. what will happen to proverbium uh, and it isn't just proverbium anna what will happen to proverbium after i stop and that is coming, as you well know, uh, I fear and certainly understand if it doesn't come out in printed form anymore. Mm -hmm. Electronically, to, co to continue electro proverbium electronically with you and Ristalina and whoever else, Melita maybe if she's interested, uh, that I think will be feasible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But to print it, and Anna, it, it is the mailing. The mailing would kill you. The Very mailing, expensive, yes, I know. The mailing alone is over $5,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of us are so grateful to you for no, you sending us. Nice of you to say, but, but and thank you. But, but uh, as I say, it's one of those commitments uh, that... Uh, uh, I made to Matikuzi at the time, you know, and also to Galit Hassan Rokem, who 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 kind of uh, did the negotiations of getting uh, Matikuzi, my dear friend, to let Proverbium move to America. Remember, Proverbium, as you know, Anachin, was dead in Finland, and then you and Wilhelm yes. Volt started Proverbium, um, Paratum. Paratum, which of course. <laughs> The end was your dissertation published, mm -hmm. and then it died. Yes. yes. So, but then, but then, uh, I still had to ask Matikuzi if I could continue it, and he mm -hmm. was not at all necessarily at the beginning in favor of it. Not mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. me, but he thought it should stay in Europe, which which mm -hmm. I think was understandable. Mm -hmm. And then Galit, Galit, uh, who was of course her, his student, her, mm -hmm. his student. Uh, she said to him, look, Mati, Wolfgang is the only one, since Wilmosh could not continue with it, he said, Wolfgang is the only one who's willing and able to do it. And then he agreed. And then in my correspondence with Mati Kuzi, every year he wrote me how pleased he, he was. You know, and, and you know, of course, that Proverbium became a yearbook and not just, you know, a 30 page issue. Yes, yes. So, 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 but that, that, that uh, proverbium has an interesting history and it, it would be nice if it could continue. Mm 
And I think it will. I'm, I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure it will. I'm hopeful. You know, the other thing issue, uh, Anna, uh, that, that I think there are two things with, with the things that you and I love, namely Proverbs. There is, of course, that giant field of phraseology mm -hmm. of which, you know, if you want to look at it this way, you could say phraseology could be the umbrella and underneath it is all kinds of stuff, mm -hmm. proverb studies as well. There is such an explosion Anna, of publishing in, in, in phraseology. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so that hardcore proverb studies, you know, are almost kind of being almost, I don't know, mm -hmm. but, but you know, it's just, let me put it this way. The wealth of publications in phraseology is getting to the point that you and I don't know anymore which of those articles deal with proverb issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another reason why I think it is so, so, I always tell my students, be sure you work on your titles of your papers mm -hmm. so that I know what the major point of your article is. Mm -hmm. In other words, don't use the word phraseologism when your article is actually about Proverbs. Yes, yes, yes. yes. It would help. You know. So, so those are some little developments, uh, um, and uh, but at the same token, I think. What do you think, Anna? Do you think proverb studies are growing a little bit? I think they are. Yeah, I, I think they are. I mean, of course, you know, just what is happening in your country. Hungary has always been a strong field in proverb studies, but still. In Eastern Europe, there are certainly yes. great interest. Yes, yes. So actually, in Hungary, we can really be proud of. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. In Poland, mm -hmm. Poland, I think Poland is as well. Yes. Very doing a great, great work. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Scandinavia is not as strong as it used to. Be. As it used to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, Auti yeah. Auti Lava Kangas, you know, Matikusi's daughter and Pekka Hakames, but that's Finland. But in Denmark and in Sweden and Norway, it is not that strong. Mm -hmm. Harald in, in, in Norway, um, but they used to be much stronger in Proverbs. Mm -hmm. Africa, Africa is strong, of course. Mm -hmm. so. Wolfgang, I have the following question. Uh, when you were a child, uh, did you ever want to become famous? Good Lord, no. <laughs> but, 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 I'm not, I am not now either, but I know. <laughs> okay, but, but do, do you know, do I, you know that you are, Wolfgang, you are extreme, an extremely famous scholar. So uh, no, no, just a couple of hours before the interview, I just thought that let me Google you. So how many times uh, is your name mentioned? And I was absolutely amazed. Absolutely amazing. I never, I never, I never, it shows you I've never. So you've never Googled yourself? <laughs> no, no, no. Mm -hmm. Anna, I, I know I never, uh, you, you know, kind of the reason why I left Germany, Anna, was not only uh, because I wanted to come to America. <clears throat> the other reason was that my father had taken me to uh, counseling, professional counseling uh, meeting. And because my other dream was to become a forest ranger. Oh. <laughs> and to this day, I remember there was that Prussian forester who stood in front of me, you know, I'm, as you know, relatively small and uh, pointed at me and said, you, you will never become a forest ranger. The reason being <laughs> because I have glasses. You couldn't have glasses at that time to be a forest ranger. So, so my world was absolutely destroyed. I'm, I'm being serious. I mean, that was my dream. I had studied books on foreign, and then I had this person in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Western part of Germany where I would go in the summer. He was a forest ranger. My whole world was shattered. So that's another reason why I fell so much in love with, them, with, with, with America. So had I stayed in Germany, I don't know, 
what would have become of me? I, I talking about depressed. I was depressed then. <laughs> maybe, maybe once in my life. And that's when I decided, okay, I'll go my own way. Mm-hmm. Making a way out of no way, remember? So, 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 uh, uh, no, I, all that I've ever done in my life, Anna, is try to be positive, work hard, and help other people. That's all that I've ever done. Mm-hmm. If, it, if it has amounted to something, well, <laughs> that's the, that is the icing on the cake, as the proverbial expression. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, well, I, I, you know, to, to be honest, though, Anna, I, 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 I am amazed at the fast shift that you pointed out. And uh, I mean, I have known so many truly famous people. We've already mentioned many of them. Uh, and and if if some people, you know, kind people like you, think I belong in in a circle of established folklorists and, and proverb scholars, well, obviously at my age that pleases me. Uh, Volker, uh, you are really the best one, <laughs> really. <laughs> So, and uh, uh, look, I mean, you know that, for example, uh, I dedicated this book to you. Oh, yeah, that's, that uh, is a good book. I, I've always enjoyed it. And, and, uh, and you know that uh, this book, which was published in Hungarian language by my co authors, Kristalina uh, Christova, uh, Katalin Varga, and Peter Parta, uh, or it was also dedicated to you. I know. There must be a reason for that. Right? There must be a reason, yes, exactly. And, and Volga, and I am so, so grateful to you. Really, I'm so, so grateful to you. So it, it's uh, uh, now it's uh, July 16th, uh, 2020, and we met in 89 it was actually middle of june uh, middle of june uh, when there was this yeah. conference so so it was um, more than 30 years ago and i remember actually you gave me immediately books or, uh, you you wrote letters to me of the way you supported me and the, a number of other scholars all over the world so it is just absolutely unbelievable but you know that that's all that, yeah and thank you anna it, it, i you know of, there is no doubt, Anna, when you write to me or Kristalina writes to me or, or, or Pekka writes to me or Auti, whoever, uh, I thrive off the, on that, of course, too. It gives me encouragement mm-hmm. to go on. And don't forget, even it is only natural for someone like me or you when you get to be my age in 25 years or 20, that you have accomplished something. But I think humility is part of being successful, mm-hmm. you know. And don't forget, I constantly learn from all the people I'm dealing with. I mean, you know, I mean, I've learned from you. I've learned from some things you, you do much better than I do. You know, that's the way it should be. Mm-hmm. But, you know, uh, so it, it's like our books, Anna. Wouldn't it be strange if I would sit here today and say, you know, my published dissertation, that was really a great piece of work. It wasn't bad. Mm-hmm. I think it was good, mm-hmm. but it wasn't necessarily great. You know, so, so it, 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 uh, uh, you, you go on. But just so you understand, I, okay, I'll grant you that I've had a little bit of success, but I also know on whose shoulders I'm standing, and I'm aware of that all the time, you know, and you can, you can look at my writings, Anna, I never hide names like Archer Taylor, you know, I still quote his book from 1931. Yes, yes. Do I, really, do I really need to do that? No, but I want to. <laughs> That's the difference. Now, there will be scholars who will say, I wouldn't put a book that was published in 1931 in my bibliography. That's absurd. 
you know. There are some wonderful letters, Anna. Uh, when I wrote my book called Proverbs, a handbook, you know, which, which I have it. Yes, 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 it's, it's a wonderful book. I think it's a pretty good book. I was I was restricted because the publisher, I could go kind of international, but the book was to be primarily English oriented or mm -hmm. Anglo American oriented. But anyway, I think it's not a bad book. Ellen Dundas, for years would say to me, Wolfgang, you have to write a new Archer Taylor book, all right? So in 1985, I finally brought out a new edition of Archer Taylor's 1930. <laughs> but I'm kind of glad I did it before my friend Alan Dundas died. One year before he died, I published my, so to speak, replacement, which it isn't, but replacement of Taylor. But in the correspondence between Dundas and me, I used to say, Ellen, I'm not ready to write that book. I think they can stand next to each other. But the classic, the classic book on the proverb is still Archer Taylor. Yes, yes. And yes. that's okay. I can live with that. Yes. Okay. And what do, what do you consider to be your greatest success in life? Oh boy, what's my greatest success in life? Hmm. Ooh, ooh, greatest success. You mean you want one item? Uh, you can you can give ten <laughs> because everything you have over well, twenty. I, I think I think the thing that I feel good about Anna is that. Uh, you know, once I think I started studying by wanting to be a mathematician and a chemist, and then I changed to the humanities, and and then maybe in my sixth semester I decided that maybe becoming a professor would be would be the way to go. If I had to do it over. I would become a medical doctor, mm. uh, but not a surgeon, but uh, a general practitioner. I think I would have liked that. Mm -hmm. But there too, and I need to be careful, the medical profession is changing so much. I would have liked to have been what the Germans call a house arts, yes. a so doctor who you. takes house visits and things like that. Anyhow, but that's gone. <laughs> uh, so. I think what I feel the best about uh, from a prof professional point of view is, I think I became a halfway decent professor. That pleases me. So, you know, I care about my students, my colleagues, um, and you know, that I've become a good proverb scholar obviously pleases me too. <laughs> But I'm not, <laughs> this is kind of fun, since we talked about religion, but I am not a god who doesn't like other gods right next to him or above him. How is that? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sounds great. So I'm just a little, a little guy who, 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 who's been fortunate enough, Anna, healthy enough, maybe even financially speaking, well enough to do kind of things that have made a difference. Absolutely. It has made a difference for me and it has made a difference. For I think it's wonderful if you, if I, you know, if I, you know, you're forcing me to have these thoughts, you know, and it, it, uh, I think publishing, let's say your newest article, or I have this African-American friend, Raymond Somerville, you, you already seen a couple of his papers in Proverbium. I, I, I have met him many times. Uh, he, he, he's, kind of big, he's kind of my mentee, you know, I mean, he looks at me as, as his mentor. And, and, you know, we've talked about racism and so on. And just today, before you, he sent me his newest manuscript. And for me, to be able to publish that for him, I feel like I'm helping a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it isn't just the scholarship, Anna. It is never, it has never been to me. Also my books, it, 
I don't write my books because I want to be the top guru power amniologist. I write it because I want to make a statement. And the older I get, you, I think, Anna, you know my work, the older I get, also my articles, the more I'm willing to say, to make a personal statement, which I didn't do when I, maybe, I, maybe a young assistant professor shouldn't or couldn't. But now I feel like, well, like our book, Anna, and you do the same thing, our book on marriage. I mean, we're actually making some personal statements in there. Yes. I have my, my newest book, Anna, is, is a book, uh, the subtitle is uh, Four African American Heroes. And it's uh, Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, Barack Obama, and Congressman John Lewis. Lewis. Four men, by chance men, it's not my fault, uh, four, four people who, whom I really, really respect. And that's quite a personal book, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, where, where I very openly declare my admiration for, for 200 years of African-American uh, uh, greatness. You know? so, so yes, I think, I think uh, sometimes I wish I had seen maybe that type of part of being a professor in writing, in writing in particular, maybe a little bit earlier, but, but it's not too late. Wolfgang, and uh, you have mentioned a number of your successes, and could you mention some failures? Have you had any failures in your life? Ask my wife. <laughs> uh, failures, failures. Um, uh, well, I mean, I can't think of any giant failures, uh, Anna, but we get back to America not being a perfect union. Am I, <laughs> am I a perfect human being? Not by far. I, I mean, I, I, I make mistakes. I mean, I... I uh, um, uh, yeah, that's an interesting question, Anna. Uh, failures. Well, one thing I really regret, Anna, and, and, and I think this shows you a little bit that I'm maybe a little bit ill. Uh, I was so committed to caring for my colleagues and my students in the Department of German and Russian for all those years, that I didn't take advantage of sabbaticals, you know, mm -hmm. going away for... So one of my biggest regrets, and the older I get, Bob and I have talked about it on numerous occasions, but I regret deeply that I didn't go back to Germany for one year. Mm. That I really do regret. I think it would have been fun to give my homeland or give me the chance to experience my homeland. You know, I left, I left disappointed and also wanting to and dreaming about America. But I think to have gone back maybe 10 years ago or so, for a year, just to immerse myself into the German society again as a guest professor, you know, would have been good. And I did, I did go as a guest professor uh, to, to Freiburg, but only in one of those compact things, you know, for two weeks. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, that, that I think was a, is a failure. I should have done that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, Anna, I'm still fulfilling my dream about becoming a forest ranger, as you well know. I could walk outside. Yes. Yes. Uh, and, and, uh, but I think those are, I mean, all the other failures, uh, Anna, are failures that all of us human beings share. Sometimes being maybe too insistent or not being kind enough or, or, uh, or 
maybe not helping when I could have been more helpful. Um, uh, but um, yeah, I think I think I'll leave it with that, Anna. I mean, I know my imperfections, and and, and I I try. <laughs> you try you try your best you try your best uh, yeah well, i think i think that's that's all that the human beings can do you know is, is to try to make it i think what i feel good about my life anna is i in a small way i feel like i've made a difference to some people mm -hmm. which is nice yes. and yes. i hope that the negative side of that is does not outweigh the positive side and Wolfgang, do you remember, uh, maybe you don't remember this, but uh, when I was in in Vermont uh, a second time, and it was during my Fulbright, and you and Barbara, you were so, so um, hospitable to me, and you really did so much for me, not only during that uh, trip of mine, but uh, uh, all the life, <laughs> or, or uh, since, since we met, you, were, you, you have uh, always... Uh, helped me so much and I remember that I told you that Wolfgang I just I will never be able to to give it back to you uh, and I remember that uh, you told me that you don't need to give it back to me so give it back to your students or okay. uh, give it back to someone who would like you to be your yeah. you supervisor. Know, that's, that's it that's interesting that you say that Anna you know we all can still learn and here here it comes i learned a new phrase mm -hmm. that everybody whom i tell it to they always say they're surprised see if you know it it relates to what you just said to pay forward have you ever heard that no to pay no, forward. No, no, no pay forward is i did things for you and i told you to you don't need to thank me a thousand times, just do it to someone else. Yes. Mm -hmm. that, that is the expression to pay forward. In other words, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and I think that that is, uh, um, and, but you also pay backwards. That's, another, that's a phrase that doesn't exist. But Anna, you've done the same for me, don't forget. I mean, yes, I've done things for you, but look at all the things you've, Look at the books we've done together. They were always your ideas, by the way. Yes, yes, Let's yes. Don't forget that. The idea, you, you, you are the one who approached me, and uh, and, and uh, I'm going, I'm going through this with Ristalina just this morning. We were riding back and forth, and yesterday and today, and uh, she wants to do an article on the paramiological minimum, and she wants to co-author it. So I wrote back and said, Ristalina you can do this on your own you don't need me build your own career and she writes back she says but i would be honored to do it with you so now we're going to do it together <laughs> but, but the idea once again is hers <laughs> sometimes i have an idea too of course but uh, but uh, uh, well i think for for us paramiologists I think I can honestly say that we are really quite a nice group of people. I mean, we all support each other. Oh, absolutely. Very nice. And, uh, you know, my co-authors, they are also my best friends. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and, and, and it's, a, it's a wonderful group. And, 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 and there are, I certainly have no envy, and I don't see why anybody else should have envy. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, you know, in, in my case, I'm simply much older than all of you guys. And, 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 mm -hmm. but. I, I take the greatest delight if you were to write you know, another one of your big bonds. How many books have you written, by the way? Uh, <laughs> so uh, so uh, this book was the 18th book. The 18th. All right then. Yeah, so, so far 18, but uh, maybe if we count my articles, maybe about 150. I haven't counted them. Well, 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 again, Anna, without hubris, you know, without being obnoxious, that already separates you quite well for many, many professorial types. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But, but nowadays, nowadays, I prefer 
uh, I prefer delivering workshops and nowadays I prefer, I mean, I cannot do workshops now yet, but, but uh, anyway, the last uh, few yeah. years um, I have primarily delivered uh, workshops and uh, now I like uh, recording. You mean, you, mean, you, mean, you mean your psychological workshops? Yes, yes, right? yes, yes, yes yeah. psychological. Well, you mean in, in a way, and if I'm not mistaken, you, you have found another career. Uh, Absolutely, career, yes. Right? That's what I said to Barbara. Uh, well, you know, in a way, and I, I have that too. I mean, remember, I'm also very much involved in Holocaust studies, you know, yes. and, and also, of course, in German stuff still. But uh, it's 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 good. F I think it is good to have more than one <laughs> more than one iron in the fire. You know, you can look and I think it keeps your mind fresh. <laughs> to uh, I always tell people, and I know you do this, work on more than one thing at the same time. You get, it, it is good to clear your mind and say, this project needs more library work. But this project, I can almost do with the knowledge I have. Mm -hmm. I just got a letter from my friend uh, Pavel from Moscow. Uh, he, he wanted me to write another article for uh, on emotions on it goes into your psychology field on emotions and linguistics and so on so guess what i chose i'm doing i did a historical survey of the golden rule in american politics wow <laughs> see, see, I could, but anna to do that i already had so much material on it that i pretty much could do it without having to go to the library. <laughs> Anyhow, so um, uh, yeah, you you your energy level, Anna, is 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 probably the biggest I've ever seen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's true. It's true. I mean, you have you carry several jobs at the same time. You 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 write. You you you. You continue studying. You fly to Moscow to study. Yeah, no, I, I do not fly to Moscow nowadays. So yeah. in November was the last time. Now, now Anna, your degree in psychology is that an MA degree or is that another doctorate? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So it's an uh, MA degree in psychology yeah, do you need to go and in coaching. Any and in coaching, but but primarily I teach uh, at the Department of English uh, Language and Literature in Slovakia, Balkan. I remember it was years ago or even decades ago when you told me that you are a happy workaholic. So, I mean, the fact that you are a workaholic is known to everyone, but you also pointed out um, those days that you are a happy workaholic. So, are you still happy? Uh, so, do you still consider yourself a happy person? Oh, absolutely. You know, I do you remember this? I published an article in Proverbium, uh, you know, I had published the correspondence between Alan Dundas and me, yes. you know that. Yes. And then I had found a few more letters. And in one of those letters, I had written about this whole idea that people always said, Alan Dundas and Wolfgang Mieder are workaholics. Mm -hmm. Now, you're the psychologist, I think, especially in the professorial profession, people who are productive uh, are easily branded to be workaholics. Yeah, yes, it, gives, yeah. it gives the person who is less productive a certain way of coping with that. Mm -hmm. That's one part of the psychology. It, but the term workaholic can also be used in a more congenial way. It doesn't have to be negative. Absolutely, Anyhow, absolutely. Especially if it's used uh, happy workaholic. So I think if it's happy yeah, workaholic. Yeah. And, and, and I think that I, I don't mind at all that people call me a workaholic. I agree with it. You could also use the word obsession if you want to. Mm -hmm. Or passion, passion actually. Or yeah. we can also say that you love your job. Yeah, that's the point. And I think happy, happy workaholic 
yeah, that's exactly what I am. I'm happy in what I'm doing. So why should I not be doing it? I'm not hurting anybody. I'm mm -hmm. still paying attention to my wife, um, to my dogs, to you. <laughs> no, I, I, I really, I think the word workaholic, if you are a workaholic because you want to be above, earn more money than everybody else, uh, be successful more than anybody else, well, then I suppose it can be kind of a disease. But if you are doing it out of engagement and commitment and interest and love, what's wrong with it? Well, I, I think it's absolutely fantastic. I remember when I was maybe about 16 years old, there was a professor in Russia who said that our, that our real happiness is when you are very happy when you go to your workplace and when you are very happy when you go back home. So, and, and actually, uh, and I think uh, this is the way how uh, you uh, live your life. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm happy when I'm home. I'm happy when I'm, you know, my father, Anna, my father was a, a middle range bureaucrat in the city of Lübeck. He went to the office all his life with his tie on, with his two briefcases, which he didn't have to do, but he brought work home. No bureaucrat brings home work, but my father did. And in a way, I see myself with my two briefcases. But my father always went to home, work happy, and came home happy. And I, I do too. I'm always happy when I come home, but I'm happy if I don't go to the university. Mm -hmm. That's not good for me. Mm -hmm. I like going. And yeah. that's going to be hard for me this next semester, Anna, not being able to go. I, you know, so I, but I'll deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, uh, workaholic is an interesting term. It, it, it really is. Uh, and uh, it, but the key word is happy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, we have, we have a more colloquial term in English. I'm a happy trooper. A trooper is a, well, like a, not a policeman, but a trooper is a, a, a person in a uniform. You know, a happy trooper means you, you're just a, basically a positive person. Mm -hmm. you know? and, uh, uh, but anyhow, I have never minded uh, people calling me a workaholic. Uh, but I do, I do know, I do know psychologically that some people uh, use that term uh, in a kind of a, yeah, kind of saying, well, Anna is a workaholic. That's why she gets so much done. So I don't have to deal with it. <laughs> that's, that's okay. That's not, not, that's not my problem. You know? <laughs> but happy, the, the key word is happy. I also consider myself a happy workaholic. So no. Yeah, I know you do. Mm -hmm. you, you, I can tell. You don't, need, you don't need to tell me that. I know that. Does that mean that I sometimes don't say this goddamn thing I'm working on? Of course. I mean, sometimes I don't enjoy what I'm doing, but it's every project has ups and downs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And can you share with us your formula of happiness? Formula? Mm -hmm. Well, when I'm talking with my students, uh, you remember many American students, Anna, don't know what they want to study when they arrive here. Mm -hmm. And many times their parents come, you know, and we get to talking about what they should study and stuff. And I, I think finding, finding something that interests you, that, that you, that you feel like you can get involved in, in making a difference. Uh, I remember when I was a student, when I went through two crises, really. Once when I decided not to continue chemistry as my major, that was a crisis of some type. And then when I decided that mathematics was not what I wanted to become a professor in. Uh, so in other words, I'm glad I made those decisions because I think Maybe I would have been a halfway decent mathematician, but I didn't think I had enough gift to really do that. So in other words, 
not pursuing something that you do because someone says if you become a lawyer you can make good money or if you become if you study for an mba you have great you should study what you feel inclined towards <laughs> for which you have a passion and in in today's world anna as far as an undergraduate degree is concerned whether you major in political science you can be trained you know if you have a brain you can think you can analyze of course if you want to become a doctor if you want to become a lawyer you got to eventually study law but the basic university eight semesters of a bachelor degree in america it actually makes very little difference what you major in if you don't plan to going on to graduate school that's a different story so uh, i think finding finding something that fulfills you at least to a certain degree i always have felt sorry for people who went through their whole life hating their job Yes. by the way i want to stress i am convinced anna that i could be a happy assembly line worker but mm -hmm. I, i would convince myself in what i'm doing is worthwhile mm -hmm. to support my family to maybe get a little motor boat to, to go out on the lake uh be that would be a mistake i think to think that people who have jobs that you and i don't want do not feel fulfilled in their work i think that would be a mistake mm -hmm. you know i know i know very very unhappy professors by the way i know i also i also know such professors mm -hmm. yeah. so 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 i think brain power intelligence level whatever profession has nothing to do with that it, it is it is uh making the best out of the work that you happen to have and of course anna if you really feel not at all fulfilled then perhaps try something else <laughs> you know i mean go back to school i know it's sometimes not possible but um uh, in america changing changing jobs is i believe still a little bit easier in america than in europe absolutely absolutely yes, yes. don't you think I, i think i'm right on that uh, yeah. yes yes and i think that people have very different attitudes towards that's it. right that's right Yeah. That, that 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 can have its downside anna let's just say you come to my office and uh, i have a job i can offer you and you're all excited about it and you start and three months later you quit because someone else offers you five cents more an hour you know in other words you know an employment an employment situation is a two-way street you know when i hire you it is my hope that you will stay <laughs> and i think in america now uh, some people uh, let their jobs go maybe a bit too i always tell my students you know on your resume i don't think it looks too good if you have i i mean a real job now and i'm not working for mcdonald's Mm -hmm. let's just say you take a job at a at a certain company it is not a good idea to leave after three quarters of a year you know, try try to stay a couple years to at least give me as your next employer the idea that you might have had reasons to change but you didn't change after you just started mm -hmm. so any anyway, those are some thoughts um, Mm -hmm. so. Welcome. And what are your qualities, or what are your 
there are habits which help you uh, to be happier and which help you to be successful? Well, good health help. I mean, health, of course, helps. Uh, Anna. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is pretty tough. Although you and I know plenty of cases where someone with cancer still has a good attitude and, 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 and remains relatively mm -hmm. happy. And, uh, but I think being, being somewhat healthy, I think, uh, certainly helps. Uh, but I think in many ways it boils down to attitude. You know, you, you're having a positive attitude going to a meeting, not automatically thinking, I'm going to hate this, or I'm going to have to fight this, but maybe listening first to see what people have to say. Maybe you need to change your mind. Um, yeah, there are, I, I, I don't think you can make a formula out of this, uh, Anna. Uh, it's a good psychological question. You know, why are people optimists and pessimists? Why? <laughs> I think if you take the spectrum of pessimism and depression and optimism and joyfulness, I think it's a balancing act. You know, and it's, it's like you can also take being a super realist and a romantic, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I think what you want to do is, in our literature classes, I often stress that. I said, you know, maybe what we want to find is a, is a balance most of the time. Um, yeah. And again, we're getting back to this idea, Anna, of, of getting up in the morning and saying, yeah, I'm ready to go. You know, see what the day will bring, uh, what challenges there might be, what problems I can solve. Is it going to be the run of the mill day? That's okay too. Uh, yeah, solving problems. I think I think Anna, if you have a job where you can solve problems, that helps. That helps to have a happy, good feeling in a way. So I sometimes wonder why people aren't more willing to go the extra mile. I think now I said it. Going home and saying, I've gone a couple times that extra inch. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a mile. I think it's also a good idea. To, to, to uh, oh, you could primitively say, what, wonder what I can do today to make one person feel a little bit better. A kind word, you know, asking a colleague how that child is doing, why not? By the way, another workaholic that I know is Valery Mokienko. <laughs> he's, he is worse than I am. <laughs> he's a good guy. It's funny how you, how, you, I, how you kind of become what I call mutual admiration club. <laughs> no, no competition, no envy, just a mutual admiration club. Isn't that wonderful? It's wonderful, yes, yes. All right, I have no more wisdom. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Wolfgang, what, uh, how would you like to finish this um, interview? We have been talking for, for almost two hours. Two hours, yeah. You told me it would take 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, well, I, 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 I'll, I'll, I will say this. I think, Anna, you, 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 you are a very good interviewer. Uh, you, you, you made me um, 
state things that I don't necessarily think about or would talk about. Uh, I uh, Important to me would be that I hope I came across uh, with humility. I, I, I would hate to have uh, things misinterpret that, that I'm on an ego trip or so, which is not at all the case. I, I know very little answers to how people can be, how people can uh, deal with success and, 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 and fame as you used and, and what, else, what was the other word? I mean, it, it, it does boil down to, in, to individual attitude, I think. But you also, you know, got out of me this thing about that regret about not having lived one more year in Germany. That the older I get, the more I feel that. Maybe I can still do it one of these days. Mm -hmm. you know? But you know, our life, Anna, you know, the property, the dogs, but that, those are excuses. Other people have gone on sabbatical too. You know? so, yes. But, uh, well, I think I, 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 I liked uh, the interview, Anna, because it, it gave me, you gave me a chance to, to think about uh, a little bit more about my life and, and uh, I, the, the thing that I, maybe this will help you. What makes me so happy? I think being thankful. I have so, so many people to be thankful for. Uh, the people, including my parents, Anna, my sister, who let me go, uh, my teachers and professors, and then all those people that you know, and then many, my students. I mean, the fact that I've been able to to kind of fulfill my dream of coming to America and also living here and making, you know, the typical first generation immigrant. That's really what I am. You know? I hate to use that old word self-made man, but in a roundabout way, I am. But only because of the help of many other people. When I use it again, on whose shoulders I stand and you do. Uh, yeah, I think being thankful, I think, has a lot to do with happiness. I never thought about that. Yes, I, I couldn't. Yeah, and I think I can see it, Anna, if you read the introduction to those letters that I published. Uh, this this appreciation of others of who have given you a break, you know, given you a, yeah, giving you a chance. America gave me a chance, Anna. So I will be forever uh, what a happy now uh, German American. But I also noticed, you know, as we said earlier in the interview, unfortunately the what is happening now. But uh, yeah, Did, in your readings with psychology, uh, Anna, does thankfulness ever pop up? Absolutely, absolutely. It's one of the, uh, mm, yes, and uh, psycho, there is a psychologist uh, in US, her name is uh, Sonia Lubomirsky, and she points it out that it's very important. If you would like to be happier, it's very important, for example, to write a diary of gratitude. Oprah Winfrey also talks about this. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad it, uh, I, I use the word thankful, but gratitude is, of course, the same word. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think gratitude is important in life. Mm -hmm. giving, giving and receiving. Well, you know, now we're getting into the Bible. But, but uh, uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, into the modern kids, Anna, with the environment and all our worries, uh, engagement, you know, uh, commitment, caring, or to use Barack Obama's term, empathy, mm -hmm. passion. We could use a little bit more in our world of that. Uh, and yet, you know, Anna, 
you know, pl playing forward. And you've done all of this. Look at, look at the letters of recommendation we write for our students. Yes, yes. You know, it is in the last five, six months, and you, and you know, I keep my correspondence. I have received so many letters from friends like you, you know, paramiology friends and so on, but also from former students, students I've had 20 years ago, all last year, saying, oh, dear Professor Mira, you know, they often write, dear Papa Mira by now, you know, dear Papa Mira, I thought of you today and I thought I'd better check in on you. Mm -hmm. By the way, there is a positive part on, on, of COVID-19. People are thinking more about other people than they used to. Mm -hmm. So, so there, there, is, there is one answer I can give you. That COVID has made that difference. I sometimes take a letter or two to, to Barbara and I say, look at, look at what, what this student wrote to me. You know, they don't want to come right out and say, you know, Papa Mira, we know you're ancient and you are a little bit in a risky category, but, but you know what they're thinking. <laughs> So yes, so you see there, is, there are some positive problems. I would prefer that we don't have to go through this crisis. <laughs> and now comes one other psychology, of, of course, Anna. And I'm sure you studied this. I, I do it via literature. We know, of course, that it is normal human behavior during a crisis be it a plane having dropped out of the heavens or whatever, uh, flood, for people to be a little bit more understanding and helpful. The problem is normalcy, normalcy, normalcy comes back a bit too fast. Mm -hmm. you know? Let's hope that people will not forget too quickly all the help that the nurses and the doctors and the caretakers have given during this time. It's, it's being verbalized quite nicely now, you know, but uh, must not forget. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think, I think gratitude, attitude, gratitude, Let's, let's finish with, with President Obama. Empathy is what the world really needs. So, two hours. Two hours, yes. Uh, Wolfgang, thank you so much. Wolfgang, I would like you to finish this interview with uh, a good proverb. With the sound. I, already gave, I, already, I already gave you three. Yes, 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 but not those ones. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> not, not the ones which, which you have given, no, not the ones which you have given, not your favorite ones, but uh, mm. the proverb, uh, please uh, finish the interview with, a, with some optimistic, some positive proverbs. So the proverbs which will uh, show that there is some light out of tunnel of the whole situation of this pandemic. Uh, mm. Well, uh... Uh, there are, you, you know, Anna, I've been studying uh, modern proverbs a lot. Yes. You know? yes. And uh, there is, there's a whole uh, kind of interesting, again, from a psychological point of view, interesting, and that is, there is a predominance of modern Anglo-American, but even more so American proverbs that deal with life, just life, mm -hmm. where, where your key word is life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what you will have is you have some proverbs that start just with life. They are normal indicative sentences, no real metaphors, mm -hmm. and yet they express much of what we've talked about. So on the more negative side, you will have things like life sucks. What is life is shit. Yeah, life, life, life is a shit sandwich. Yes, okay. life, life is a bitch. 
But on the more positive side, and I really like these, uh, very simple, life is a journey. Now, that doesn't have to be an ultimate American piece of wisdom, but it is a little bit, I'm not surprised that it is a relatively new American proverb and it could, it might well e exist in, in other countries too. Uh, you know, but life is a journey, I, I think, shows so very much that whatever we do here in our individual lives, as a, to look at it as a journey that has a beginning and unfortunately also an end, but that every segment of that journey is an experience worthwhile having and making the best of it. You know? So that's one, life is a journey. And then there's another one. I used, I used it for an article that I wrote about Hillary Clinton. And that is, life is not a spectator sport. Oh, could you repeat that, please? I couldn't hear. Life, life is not a spectator sport. In yeah. other words, you, 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 don't go, you don't go to a foot, football game and just sit there and, and yell and, and, and are excited when the goal is shot. But rather, life is something that you need to get involved with. You know. So again, life being that one chance that you have to make a difference and uh, not just sit on the sideline all the time. Sometimes we do, we all do, go on vacation, don't we? Mm -hmm. you know? but, uh, but life is not a spectator sport, I think, is, uh, and life is a journey, uh, is, is, is a good, good thing for young people to think about. Uh, I, as you well know, many of these thoughts we get when we get older. <laughs> but uh, uh, so um, I think I'll leave it with that, Anna. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. So, but now I'm going to have some lunch. How is that? Yes, yes, and I will have some dinner. <laughs>